Governor Andrew Cuomo has stated that he will let science, not emotion, guide his decision on whether or not to let the gas industry frack in New York State. With the gas-bearing Marcellus Shale formation underlying 50% of the state, and with the gas industry proposing upwards of 100,000 gas wells, his decision could fundamentally transform New York. Please welcome Tom Ridge. You are the former governor of the great state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, first secretary of Homeland Security. Now you, you are a lobbyist for the natural gas industry. Yep. We've all seen the footage of flaming water. Whoa. Is that really happening to people's water supply, sir? Out here is the rock. We're looking in a cross section of a well that's being drilled. Because ultimately, you want your gas to come up the steel pipe. That inch right there, this is cement. And what you don't want is for that cement to fail mm -hmm. or to be absent, to crack, to corrode, to crumble, to disappear. If what's down there can get into this annulus, then it can migrate. Uh, yes, it is happening to some water supplies and it has absolutely nothing to do with hydraulic fracking. Methane gas is naturally occurring. They've had methane gas, I'm speaking as a governor, in some of our water wells in Pennsylvania long before any wells, fracked wells, were located next to them. Those are phenomena that are very well known for as long as we've been drilling wells and casing them. Naturally occurring methane gas often ends up in water wells, but there has not been a single proven instance where it has been related to hydraulic fracking. So now the shallow gas goes into an open annulus, pressurizes the annulus, gas migrates into an underground source of drinking water, somebody's water well. Gas drilling and hydraulic fracturing is an inherently contaminating industrial process that injects millions of gallons of water laced with toxic chemicals at enormous pressure to break apart rock and release gas from underground formations. Watersheds across the nation have been contaminated with plastics, carcinogens, neurotoxins, and endocrine disrupting chemicals, and with explosive natural gas. Whoa. It causes massive land scarring, air pollution, a public health crisis, truck traffic, miles and miles of pipelines, blowouts, spills, accidents. It is a whole-scale industrialization. I released Gasland in June of 2010. One day that month, I got an email. It was from the New York Times. A document called Debunking Gasland, a long list of points which the gas industry had made against my film. Their chief point was that the shot seen around the world from Gasland of Mike Markham lighting his water on fire Whoa. was somehow a fake, not due to drilling, that the methane in his water well was quote unquote naturally occurring. Was anybody buying it? I happened to be in Pittsburgh right around this time and luckily was able to sit down with Doug Shields, the leader of city council, who was able to pass a ban on hydrofracking throughout the city. You want the computer on to make it look like actually no. worker? Okay. Pittsburgh's public drinking water supply had been shut down by gas drilling waste getting to the Monongahela River just a year earlier. They allowed them to just go dump the stuff in the river. They were literally taking the waste product of all those chemicals, yeah. all those volatile organic Radionuclides, all, those all this other stuff, into the river. Directly into the drinking water supply. Directly into the drinking water supply with a minimal of treatment. The inference being, well, we sent it to a treatment plant, and the inference to the public is somehow this water is being made whole again, and all the bad things are removed, and that's simply not true. not true. The New York Times put star investigator Ian Urbina on the case. Their investigation uncovered thousands of internal documents showing that radioactive wastewater and harmful carcinogens such as benzene were being inadequately treated and put back into drinking water supplies all over Pennsylvania. But Doug explained to me that this isn't always the way journalism works. You know, they're coming in and telling me the sky is pink all day. That it's pink. So he told me, most of the journalism out there isn't investigative journalism. It's what you call he said, she said journalism. So if someone's in the room with the media and the person says, the sky is blue, then the media report that day is the sky is blue. But if someone comes in at the last minute and says, no, wait, 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 the sky is actually pink, well, then the media report that day is going to be the facts are being debated. It isn't blue, it's really pink. And if you leave that on the table and don't rebut that, 
then the sky is pink. And that is what the oil and gas industry has done. And the sky is pink in Harrisburg. We've seen the movie. We have saw tobacco companies sit in front of microphones and perjure themselves in front of the United States Congress, fine upstanding citizens with money, corporate executives saying, I can't, you know, though I, I do not believe t tobacco causes cancer. And meanwhile, the memo's back in their drawer that says otherwise. In the 50s, Hill and Knowlton PR firm designed the strategy to dispel that nasty little rumor that tobacco caused lung cancer. Misinformation, and supporting bogus science that would call into doubt the legitimate science. The American Natural Gas Association hired Hill and Knowlton in 2009 as their PR firm. All of a sudden, ads were everywhere. They even bought my name on Google. Naomi Oreskes, author of the book Merchants of Doubt, traced disinformation campaigns from big tobacco all the way up to climate change. When I opened your book, I saw Hill and Knowlton is the author of this okay. strategy for tobacco, and Hill and Knowlton was hired by the American Natural Gas Association. Oh, so there it is. So 60 years later, right, we have the same PR firm that actually invented. John Hill was the originator of this whole strategy. So there they are still doing the same thing again 50, 60 years later. Wow. It's, wow. <laughs> it's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> if we say, you know, oh yes, oil and gas come out of people's taps naturally. You know, a lot of people just don't know. They think, oh really, is that true? You know, oh well, I have heard people, I've had heard people say that in Santa Barbara the tap water smells bad, you know, so may, maybe it's true. Okay, now we have a debate, right? An ordinary person who doesn't know what to think doesn't need to think that I'm right. They just need to think that there's a debate because so long as there's a debate, then there's an argument for staving off regulation. Science that really shows that these claims that you're talking about are preposterous. I mean, how do we know that climate change is real? How do we know that tobacco kills people? How do we know that acid rain is caused by burning coal in power plants in the Midwest? How do we know that oil and gas doesn't normally come out of your tap? Well, the answer is we know through scientific studies and scientific understanding. It's just like the tobacco industry had memos in their drawers that said all along that they knew that nicotine was addictive and tobacco was harmful. The gas industry has memos in their drawers. We have some of them. Some of them, in fact, have been published. Others fell off the back of a truck, but here they are. And they'll show you how they've been trying to solve it for decades and how they have no way of completely fixing or preventing the problem. Number one, from Southwestern Energy, the diagram clearly shows that the gas well has a cement barrier around the sides of it that prevents gas from lower layers migrating upwards into aquifers. This isn't a PowerPoint about drilling wells. This is a PowerPoint about how casings fail and allow gas and other substances to migrate into aquifers. It's one of their own documents about how cement fails. Number two comes from Schlumberger, oil field review published in 2003 that showed that sustained casing pressure, i.e. casing failure, occurs at alarming rates. Their own documents showed that well casings failed in 6% of wells drilled immediately upon drilling and that those well casings deteriorated over time. That over a 30 year period, 50% of well casings failed. Number three, this report shows gas migration at astronomical rates in deviated or horizontal wells. Number four, surface casing, the casing around the groundwater, doesn't help the problem at all. Number five, this report leaked out of a gas industry conference from Archer, a well services company, shows enormous rates of leakage in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea, and high rates of what they call uncontrolled discharge. Recent Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection statistics back up Schlumberger's initial findings. Well leakage was between 6.2 and 7.2 percent for newly installed wells, gas migrating into aquifers. So does anybody want to guess how long a gas well has to last? Not to produce gas, but to do its other function of protecting the groundwater from underground sources of chemicals and gas that could migrate. I'll give you a hint. It begins with an F. Forever. These well casings and these gas wells have to last forever, or else they pose an immediate and constant risk to groundwater. So what about Mike Markham? Let's go a little bit further into that. Ball of fire erupts, almost enveloping Markham's head. How do the we gas square industry that is saying that according to Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, Mike Markham's methane 
was biogenic or shallow gas. Uh, what's called biogenic methane Me is naturally occurring biogenic methane. So because it wasn't the gas they were drilling for, it wasn't their fault. Deeper gas, the gas that they frack for, is for the most part thermogenic. But as it turns out, the whole argument is misleading. Because even though the gas company wasn't drilling for biogenic gas, the drilling process could have caused biogenic gas to leak up into the aquifer. As you see here from this Lumberger article, pockets of shallow gas can find a way to escape up failed casings into aquifers. The gas industry has seen this as such a problem that they would write and publish a scientific study. So drilling can liberate both kinds of gas, biogenic and thermogenic. But actually in Gasland, there are many families who can light their water on fire. The very next house was the house of Amy Ellsworth, about a mile from Mike. In fact, you can see her house from Mike's house. My safety, my health, my family's safety is the thing that's the most important to me. Her case was confirmed by Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission as being thermogenic. COGCC said that it was the gas industry's fault. In fact, the COGCC cite many examples of thermogenic methane migration in their 2010 groundwater report. And in their groundwater report is something interesting. Accounts of orphaned or abandoned gas wells. Some of these gas wells were drilled as early as 1911 or in the 1920s. Who knows how long those abandoned gas wells have been leaking gas and other contaminants in the groundwater. But what about fracking? In 2011, Environmental Working Group released a report showing that EPA actually confirmed that fracking could directly contaminate a water supply, as it did in one case in West Virginia, where a lateral fracture hit an abandoned gas well with cracked casing. For decades, they haven't been able to fix the problem. There's no way to fix it. Just like tobacco, they have a problem that can't be solved. Just as there's no safe cigarette, there's no safe drilling. And they know it. Kerosene, benzene, urea, toluene. How many of those can I feed my toddler? Because <laughs> it's perfectly safe, right? It's perfectly safe. And how can you separate the science from the emotions? In this case, it is the science that provokes the emotion. It's the science that tells us how to feel. There's one other way that the situations compare. The first major health study on the effects of gas drilling was done in Garfield County, Colorado. Researchers found the potential for acute health problems related to gas drilling activities in the water and in the air. The Colorado School of Public Health found that there was a likelihood of health effects from pollution from gas drilling and that the magnitude of these health effects was moderate to high. In Texas, as throughout the United States, cancer rates fell, except in one place in the Barnett Shale. The five counties where there was the most drilling saw a rise in breast cancer throughout the counties. The gas industry's response was a pink drilling rig. Maybe they think the sky is actually pink and they're just trying to blend in. You just can't make this stuff up. Hundreds of doctors have signed letters to the New York State Department of Health asking that a full health impact assessment be conducted before New York starts issuing permits. It was time for a trip to Albany. Things that look safe today, you know, aren't so safe tomorrow. Uh, we have an abundance of fresh water here in New York. We have great water supply. We consider that a tremendous asset. We don't want to impact that in New York. A motion right now to put forward a health impact assessment before any contemplation of doing this. Do, do you support that? Yeah, having represented uh, the 9-11 area, uh, you know, the World Trade Center, I, I can say this, even though the, you know, the severity of that tragedy is different than what we're talking about. Uh, you know, at the time, the federal EPA came in and said the air quality was safe. And now people are dying from cancer as a result of saying it was safe. I would rather know the health consequences now before we allow this irreversible damage to our water supply uh, to take place. Yeah, well, this is not an industry that is uh, well known for its uh, truthfulness or, its, or for being forthcoming on issues. 
And, you know, look, it's, there's a long, sad history of this, not just in New York State, but around the country, coming from businesses, from industries who promised, oh, you know, just let us do our little thing here and, you know, we'll be a benefit to the state and we're not going to cause any problems. And then they contaminate a site and they walk away from it. This is going to be just the next version of that long, sad history of lying, contaminating, polluting, and then sticking the taxpayers with the cost. If people, again, sit with industry represents telling them, no, here's all the evidence that it's no problem at all, mm -hmm. that that does create doubt, and that's a problem for trying to move legislation. Mm -hmm. There is enough science out there pointing to huge problems, if not screaming problems. Mm -hmm. There's no question that if people hadn't talked about this and cared about this, right. it would have happened. It would have happened under cover of night. And the first time we would have heard about fracking in New York would have been at the first crisis. New York City has clean, safe, free water, allows New York City to be what it is. Mm -hmm. And when it became clear very quickly that this would be insane in the New York City watershed, the next question gets asked by the public automatically. Well, if it's not safe for the New York City watershed, why is it safe for someone else's? I think there's just been a tremendous mobilization of New Yorkers. I mean, 66,000 comments went to the DEC. It's unheard of. The last record on the number of comments on an environmental issue was 1,000. It just hits this primal cord with people. This is our water. In early June 2012, the New York State DEC floated a possible drilling plan to the New York Times. It said that drilling would be limited to five counties. But there's nothing concrete to suggest that that isn't just a beginning. Once regulations are passed, they're passed for the entire state. The DEC's proposal has no plan to deal with wastewater, like in Pennsylvania, has no plan to deal with health impacts or do a health impact assessment, like in Texas, and like everywhere in the world, has no way to deal with long-term casing problems. Cement failure caused the blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Cement failure caused the massive gas leak in the North Sea. They don't want you to know that Tom Ridge was paid $900,000 to serve as chief spokesperson for the Marcellus Shale Coalition, or that Tom Corbett, governor of Pennsylvania, was given $1.6 million in campaign contributions by the gas industry, or that they've spent $3 million lobbying Albany and $747 million, nearly three quarters of a billion dollars, lobbying Washington. So if New York State starts drilling tomorrow and Andrew Cuomo is elected for a second term, by the end of his second term as governor, it's safe to say that 20% or more of oil and gas wells installed in his first term will be leaking. These are the facts that they don't want you to pay attention to. This is them telling you the sky is pink. New York needs new energy, not the lies of the past. Who would you trust with our future? Paid industry spokespeople or the people bringing to light the very documents that the gas industry is trying to hide? Governor Cuomo, what color will the sky be over New York?